All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, welcome to this joint press conference related to the mandates on torture. Uh, let me introduce our panel. They will give brief opening remarks, and then, of course, we will take your questions. And as you know, there was a briefing today to the third committee of the General Assembly on this topic. Um, directly to my left is Dr. Alice Jill Edwards. She's the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture and Other Cruel, Inhuman, or Degrading Treatment or Punishment. Mr. Claude Heller is the chairperson of the Committee Against Torture. And let me just note that Mr. Heller has a hard out at 2 p.m., so he might have to leave before the rest of the panel. And sitting next to him is Ms. Suzanne Jepper, the chairperson of the Subcommittee on Prevention of Torture. Let me turn it over directly to Dr. Edwards. Thank you very much, and thank you very much uh, for your interest. Uh, I presented my second interim report to the General Assembly Third Committee today, which has two parts. The first part is a, essentially a wrap-up of where I see the state of uh, torture in the world, and it's a rather bleak uh, and grim picture of escalating incidents of torture, in particular war-related torture, but also in the context of uh, policing peaceful protests, um, of which the second part of my report is most connected. The second part of my report was to uh, urge states to uh, develop a torture-free trade instrument that would ban a certain number of items from trade internationally and also regulate others that are at heightened risk of torture. I presented uh, to the committee, and that is available online, a uh, list of 20 items that are being used by public authorities in almost all regions of the world that I consider to be inherently torturous. Uh, in other words, inherently cruel, inhuman, or degrading uh, in either their design or their purpose. I can go into more detail uh, in the question and answer session. Thanks so much. Thank you. Mr. Heller. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, as usual, the the committee, as the other treaty bodies, present the report, uh, annual report, to the, the states in the third uh, committee. In the case of uh, the CAT, as the Committee Against Torture, we present a resume of the number of uh, which uh, uh, states uh, have presented the report to the committee that the committee had to overview. And uh, the diversity of situations uh, is uh, very clear when we have considered Brazil, Colombia, Ethiopia, or Uganda, as well uh, the uh, Iceland or New Zealand and, and uh, uh, Switzerland. No? So it's the diversity of the world. And uh, at the same time, we have insisted on the, the need to go on on the ratification. Uh, the, the convention has uh, 173 uh, uh, state uh, parties. Uh, our other role that it's important is, of course, uh, the individual complaints that the committee received, but I want to I want to stress that uh, 69 uh, state parties have recognized the competence of the committee to receive the individual uh, communications, and also we call for the cooperation of all states because we when in some cases we have the the, the, the relation has not been very good as is the case of Nicaragua. It's not only with the convention on torture or the CAT. It's where all the treaty bodies in some sense, and uh, we proceed to uh, review the case of uh, Nicaragua, even without the participation of a delegation, and we arrive to concluding uh, observation. Let me say also that uh, one uh, main issue that uh, as a chair of the, the meeting of the chairs of the treaty body uh, this year. We are involved in the process of the strengthening uh, reform of the treaty body system that is in discussion for a long time since uh, 2012 in the, in the, in the UN. Uh, we have uh, stressed the importance to have more financial and human resources in order to deal 
with the backlog that we are confronting and the, the challenge that we are uh, 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 confronting in the present uh, situation. And we, are all, we have also insisted in the, that we, we are recommitted that it is very strict in, uh, with uh, its mandate. We are not a political body for uh, that uh, there were several, uh, of course, accusations uh, between states, but uh, this is not our role. We are not a political organ. And on, on the contrary, what we look for is to have a constructive approach with all states in order to, uh, to, that, to, to achieve the main goal, that is the, uh, the compliance with the convention, the prohibition of torture, the prevention of torture. So uh, these are our main issues. Thank you. everyone <clears throat> thank you for your interest in uh, uh, really engaging with us uh, this afternoon after presenting uh, our annual report uh, to the third committee and um, I, uh, I presented the report uh, um, on behalf of my uh, committee the subcommittee on prevention of torture I would like to highlight that uh, we are um, a, we have a specific mandate we are uh, not examining report. What we do is we conduct visit to state parties, and uh, this is what I highlighted in our in my report today about uh, the eight visit uh, visited in uh, uh, conducted in 2022, and about uh, seven are uh, eight other eight uh, also during 2023. And uh, highlight, I highlighted the challenges we are facing and uh, what we really can uh, um, uh, bring and put from uh, our field work and findings. Um, uh, highlighted the challenges we are facing uh, related to migration detention, um, to the corruption, to the self-management in detention, also uh, to the restriction to uh, some um, to some facilities and. Uh, to also um, the lack of uh, cooperation in somehow with some state in, in, in some region. And uh, um, uh, this is what I'm really stressed on. And um, I'm also uh, speaking about uh, our counterpart on the ground, the National Preventive Mechanism, who really uh, they, they do a great job and uh, they lack resources and uh, also uh, need to be supported by state it, uh, themselves who really establish this mechanism to keep them uh, really op uh, independent and well resourced and uh, uh, to, to conduct uh, effectively their mandate. And um, that's it. I'm here to, to really to answer your question if, uh, if uh, may any question will be raised. Thank you so much. Great. Well, we'll start with Ibtissam. Um, before your question, though, just want to remind you all that while we all know each other, the panelists do not. So grateful if you could introduce yourself. Ibtissam. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the briefing. Uh, in behalf of United Nations Correspondent Association, thank you for the briefing. My name is Ibtissam Azim from Al Arabi Al Jadid newspaper. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first one about the situation in uh, Israel and Palestine, the occupied Palestinian territory. If you could. Uh, say if any of you could say something to the situation there, not only on the, um, uh, how w what's happening, um, but also regarding uh, administrative detention, legal uh, things that are allowed there that are um, um, internationally prohibited. Uh, and also in the situation in Egypt, uh, we know that there's a, a large number of people politically uh, um, who were arrested. Um, do you have more information on uh, what's happening there? Thank you. Uh, th thank you very much uh, for the question. In relation to the first uh, point in relation to Israel-Palestine, I also expressed to the uh, UN member states and the third committee uh, that, in fact, I've been shaken by the mass murder and kidnappings of civilians by Hamas in Israel. I'm also watching with alarm uh, at the Israeli siege um, of residents of Gaza, 
uh, and the restrictions on fuel, food and water, as well as uh, denying, at least last I heard, access for humanitarian uh, relief. Um, I have called on the protection of civilians and respect for international law, of course, as a first step. Um, I signed up to a joint statement that was published today with around 30 other special procedure mandate holders where we are really stressing for accountability but also to restart uh, the peace negotiations and to really find uh, a resolution to this long-standing uh, conflict. In the con like before the loss, that I haven't um, yet. Uh, the special rapporteur on OPT has been taking the lead. Um, what I can say is the that there are concerns around the mass incarceration of Palestinians in Israeli prisons. I have not visited uh, these locations to be able to verify uh, data. Um, and the information. So at this stage, um, the the con the 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 ongoing um, conflict is needs a resolution. It's been going on for way too long, um, and I worry about that situation and many more around the world where we seem to have lost our peacemakers and our peace brokers. Um, so I would also appeal to the states in the context of this uh, recent um, escalation that, of course, the hostages are treated in conformity with the absolute prohibition on torture, but likewise any detainees or others who are captured uh, by the Israeli forces, uh, the standards on treatment of prisoners of war must also uh, apply. Uh, I, I can say a few words because uh, uh, the Subcommittee on Prevention of Torture recently, two weeks ago, visited Palestine. But we engage only with the Palestinian authorities. We visited Ramallah only. We do not get access to prison under the, uh, under the responsibility of, uh, of uh, Hamas. And, uh, um, of course, our report will be delivered to the state after the visit and uh, we brief them immediately and I think that uh, torture uh, is still practices but uh, the, during the visit uh, uh, there is a lot of um, interest from the Palestinian government and they fully cooperate with the uh, SPT delegation and of course related to the war should have a solution because it's uh, the the really and the humanitarian action is needed and uh, uh, it's time to to have a solution for this long uh, really uh, conflict yeah. I would like to just to, to add that the, the state of Palestine present uh, it's a state party to the convention against torture and they submitted their first report to the, the committee. So you can find uh, the concluding observations that the committee and the recommendations that the committee made uh, to, to Palestine in the web uh, site of the uh, committee. But it was the first uh, important approach to do recognizing all the challenges that uh, Palestine uh, has in not the, in the present conflict in the general situations uh, that uh, it has lived in the through so the years. Thank you. Uh, um, sorry, just, uh, sorry, I don't want to take, uh, but uh, because my question was also about Palestinian prisoner in Israeli uh, prisons. Do you have access? Are you able to document any torture? In There's more than 1,000 Palestinian um, um, people, uh, including children, who are in administ administrative detentions without any um, charges, etc. Were you able, or other political prisoners, more than 5,000, were you able to document or have you any access to Israeli, um, um, uh, working with Israeli authorities to document the torture against Palestinian prisoners? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm obviously aware of um, uh, the figures and also the situation. I've received no allegations um, myself, which is part of the basis for acting. Um, I am concerned about arbitrary detention uh, and generally as well as uh, using detention under uh, terrorism and terrorism-like charges. Uh, I am uh, aware of the situation in particular of a lot of children in uh, Israeli uh, prisons. At this stage, I have not um, uh, had that information brought to the, the mandate. Um, and I have a longer term plan, but I can't, um, uh, which is an unsatisfactory answer, uh, of course. Um, at my next uh, report is on prisons to the Human Rights Council next year, which is on prison management uh, and uh, looking at some of these circumstances. Thanks very much. Afram Kusaifi from Arab News Daily. Uh, a question for Ms. Jabber first. Um, you spoke about the lack of cooperation from certain states. Um, are, is there any particular state that you're extremely concerned about, you'd like to visit, and you haven't had the chance yet? And if so, can you name it? Who are your top, which countries are your top concerns when it comes to torture? Um, um, and you, sir, you spoke about um, uh, in the case of Nicaragua, you were able to continue with your work with or without the cooperation of the delegation. But how important is it uh, to have the support of the delegation or the, to be able to do your job? That second. And Dr. Edwards, can you tell us something about terrorism uh, being used as a blanket term by many regimes and by many governments to imprison fr uh, f freedom thinkers, human rights defenders, freedom fighters? all of that. How much is that being uh, used more and more these days to justify torture? Um, thank you. I will go first. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Of course, as you know, that uh, um, we are, as SPT, Subcommittee on Prevention of Torture, in our mandate, the principle of confidentiality is we, we really, we need to, to consider this in our relation with any state party. This first. But what we can, I can share with you, you name it, Nicaragua, for example, one of the states we really, uh, because we brought this to the cut under Article 16.4, that uh, uh, the lack of cooperation, and uh, we together, we uh, we conducted a press release, and uh, we, we mentioned, but we still continue, even even we are in that situation, we still continue to engage and uh, to allow state to cooperate. And uh, there is a county reporter who continue doing this job. And uh, this is the purpose of, uh, of uh, our mandate to, to build this constructive dialogue to prevent torture. I would just uh, add that uh, following the procedures, the committee can uh, review the state with, uh, without the presentation of the state. No? There was an old report. Uh, there was the pandemic that interrupted all this, uh, the, this process. But we have uh, many sources of information, of course. No? Of NGOs were very active. Uh, we have information for the human uh, inter-American human rights uh, commissions. We have also briefings uh, with the UN offices in diverse, diverse uh, places. And we send our concluded observation to the state uh, party to see a reaction. There was no answer. Uh, we adopted first provisional uh, final observation, and after in November the last year, we adopted this observation. And uh, I think that the final observation that approved uh, stand in the present situ situation of Nicaragua. The concern is the, 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 the hostility of a state party to the treaty bodies uh, system. UN and also inter-American uh, system, but uh, it's a deliberate po policy in this matter. Thank you. 
Uh, what what we uh, and what I've seen is an increase in uh, a number of countries of clampdowns on political opponents and human rights defenders, quite often under terrorism designations, including of uh, anti-torture uh, NGOs also, but also broader human rights NGOs. Um, this has occurred in, uh, I've been involved in cases uh, in relation to the Russian Federation, Turkey, um, I'm aware of cases in Pakistan. Um, I would say that terrorism and the terrorism framework is not always the right frame to use and it can be very easily manipulated by one side or the other and is unhelpful. Um, in that respect, I would much prefer to be looking at what the actions are of individuals under international human rights law and under international humanitarian law and also ordinary criminal law, of course, subject to um, assessing that in alignment with uh, human rights law. Um, of course, the violent pursuit of political uh, goals is not a defence uh, to criminal uh, behaviour, so that's kind of the starting point. And of course, individuals have no right to interfere in the rights of, uh, of others. Um, but I have seen a rise in uh, the use of loose language um, and categorising different entities under that frame. Thank you very much. My name is Yvonne Murray. I'm with RTE News, uh, Ireland's national media. Um, I have a few questions. Would you mind all of you speaking a little bit about Iran um, and the uh, allegations of, of brutality with regard to the policing of protests there? Um, any more details you can, you can share um, that you have found out in the course of your work? Um, you mentioned, I think it was in, in your remarks um, to the General Assembly this morning, that there are private companies uh, free to develop and sell items which can be used as instruments of torture. Can you explain where they are manufactured? Which countries are they manufactured in and how do you prevent uh, that trade? Um, and then a uh, third question with regard to Xinjiang, which was also mentioned in your report. Uh, China has not fully responded to your inquiries. Um, is this something that you, uh, that you can compel China to do, following a model perhaps, as you mentioned, with regard to Nicaragua? Or um, wh where do you go from here? What's the next step? Uh, th thank you very much for the questions. I've been involved in uh, a number of approach, uh, approaches to the Iranian authorities regarding uh, the uh, women life freedom uh, protests last year as well as uh, the violence that ensued but also the, the prosecutions of individuals for criminal activity and also the imposition of the death penalty on some of those. Those discussions are ongoing. The figures seem to be very mixed. Um, I don't have clear figures and the government disputes the figures that um, we've been able to uh, gather. Uh, I, uh, they are, and they've informed me that they're involved in putting together a new committee uh, to look at some of these issues. I've reminded them of the need uh, to make sure that the committee is independent and representative of, of women and others who are involved in the movement. Um, uh, I'm at this stage still in engagement uh, with them and will continue uh, to do so. Um, I'll go to China and Changjing uh, second. Um, along with other special rapporteurs, we called for a special session of the Human Rights Council last year and have also, uh, based on our research, sent allegation letters to the Chinese government. Um, at this stage, I find that this has gone very quiet. Um, I am, and I expressed this today in the third committee, open to uh, carry out visits. Um, to any country that wishes uh, uh, to collaborate. And I think with China, there's definitely a need to uh, relook at some of these issues and uh, to keep make sure that the international community keeps them on uh, the agenda. Um, in relation to your question about private companies, yes, so my research found that, um, so essentially for the first time, I. As, as a Special Rapporteur on Torture, I've provided a list of 20 items that I consider are inherently cruel, inhuman or degrading by design or purpose. Um, in other words, they've been designed purely with the 
purpose uh, to inflict unnecessary or excessive harm on individuals and they have no legitimate law enforcement or other purpose that couldn't be achieved by another instrument that is also uh, available. Uh, my research found that at least 335 companies in 54 countries around the world are manufacturing and promoting uh, the items on my prohibited list, what I'm calling my prohibited list. I'm asking for countries to immediately ban those, to do a stock take, to look at their what they're procuring from other countries, what their police forces and prison authorities and psychiatric institutions, etc., are using in relation to people. And then there's a broader list of uh, more general law enforcement equipment that is quite often used um, uh, or poorly deployed, uh, especially in these pre-protest uh, environments, and there I found at least 63 countries, um, companies in at least 63 countries are manufacturing those uh, uh, items. I can give you the major producers of law enforcement equipment include China, the European Union, Israel, Russia. United Arab Emirates and the United States and some com countries that are in emerging economies such as Brazil, Turkey and South Africa are also building their capacity both for domestic purposes and also for um, external sale. I, I would just uh, clarify that uh, Iran is not a state party to the Convention Against uh, Torture. It's one of the 22 states that are not party to the uh, Convention. So we have not uh, the possibility to, to address the situations. Uh, I will commend the work of the so-called Initiative Against Torture, that is uh, uh, states uh, that in different uh, regions that uh, to try to pro promote the ratification. Concerning China, I think the, the important, an important announcement uh, in the meeting that we have the, this morning is that they are preparing their next report. Uh, they presented the last report, I think, in 2014, 2015. Of course, the, all this issue will emerge when there will be an official presentation of the periodic uh, report by uh, China. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer Peltz from the Associated Press. This is for Dr. Edwards, and following on that last question about your proposal regarding prohibiting and controlling some of this equipment, how do you think that would work, and how, what kind of feedback have you gotten on it, particularly from law enforcement entities? So the... There's been a uh, UN process that started some uh, time ago, um, uh, and my predecessors as Special Rapporteurs also called for kind of the elimination from certain torture tools from uh, general law enforcement. Um, we're not talking, and I'm not talking about uh, regulating ordinary household items, which has been a concern of some states, nor am I talking about um, uh, stopping the trade in ordinary law enforcement or uh, equipment. Uh, what the instrument, it could be a treaty, it could be some other type of agreement, but I think something um, that holds states to account, but they also have a, a kind of a roadmap of what they're supposed to do. In the first instance, even without that uh, uh, agreement, uh, states should ban the items on my list. Um, and do a stock take, check if they're in supply, check if their police officers and others are equipped with this, uh, this uh, equipment and restraints uh, and decommission and destroy them. Um, the, one of the ideas that I propose to the states is that there would also be a trigger mechanism. So when one is... Uh, a trading company and or state, there will be a mechanism by which if a, if a supply to a country that 
is suddenly engaged and embroiled in um, egregious violations of human rights, including uh, cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment, even with ordinary law enforcement equipment, there would be a trigger mechanism to stop that trade so that one is not complicit in the harms that are being perpetrated on the other side. Um, it would require also, of course, uh, trade and customs officials to be quite clear on what items they need to be checking um, uh, that are being uh, traded, as well as uh, trade fairs, etc., that do promote and sell these uh, items. Um, so I think that... Um, what was your second question? Sorry. Ah, what kind of feedback? Yes, so there, there is already a global alliance or for a torture-free trade being coordinated by Argentina, Mongolia, Mongolia and the European Union. They have 63 states that are in favour of some kind of instrument. Um, I hope that the next stage will be to adopt a resolution in the General Assembly to start the process of actually negotiating what this might look like. I hope my report will be uh, instructive uh, to that. There is also a very large coalition of NGOs uh, from all different parts of the world that are backing this, and they recently uh, adopted a declaration called the Shoreditch Declaration where they are encouraging states uh, to do this. Um, I mean, f trading these items in 54 countries is quite extensive. Um, on the other hand, there's never been a list as the list I've provided that has told states and they're now on notice that these items are prohibited. So I'm going to be continuing to monitor and also update the list as developers create um, certain items. I mean, what we're talking about in terms of the items are things like spiked battens that literally just rip through the skin. We're talking about... Um, knuckle cuffs uh, and finger cuffs that some have serrated edges on them. We're talking about electric shock bands that sit, that, are, that um, defendants are made to wear in court and if they are restless they will be zapped from the other side of the room. We're talking about caged beds so people are literally constrained. Uh, in those places, we're talking about tiger chairs and, and the metal chairs where people cannot move or are held in stress positions for hours while they are being interrogated, which for me conflicts with the whole idea of the presumption of innocence and the ability to remain silent if you are being held down and unable to move. There are a lot of instruments that are in use, such as gang chains, which is um, chaining individuals to other individuals, there's a high possibility of um, falls and falling over and causing injury to others. And of course, uh, a lot of those instruments I've classified also as degrading and humiliating. They actually are remnants of slavery and servitude and they really conjure up terrible images. Um, through to very modern instruments such as uh, millimeter wave weapons, which are designed to heat the uppermost layer of the skin in a crowded area so people will disperse on the basis of the unbearable pain, but they will not know where the pain is coming from, so there will be stampedes. Um, and, um, and of course, the health effects of this have not been properly uh, analysed, so that also... Uh, is on my list. And then there are old-fashioned instruments like lathies, very long battens, of course. They have greater kinetic energy. Um, and jambox in, uh, in other parts of the world. So there's a list of 20 similar items that I consider to be essentially modern-day torture tools and human rights-compliant law enforcement um, should not be equipped with these, these um, with this equipment. Um, some of them are turning ordinary equipment, ordinary offensive equipment into offensive weapons, for example, spiked battens and spiked shields and electric shields and electric 
uh, battens. So the list is quite uh, grievous, uh, to be honest, and um, I think it's worthwhile going into kind of, uh, you know, what the trade actually looks like. Um, there's a big responsibility on manufacturers to stop trying to find the most extreme forms of pain on individuals uh, when we have uh, some of the ordinary law enforcement equipment, such as ordinary batons and shields that do the job uh, with well-trained people just as uh, more effectively. Before, just a moment, please. Uh, I may add something related to this really important when you ask about measures. I, I think that uh, uh, there is a big role here for after this report uh, to raise awareness between different organs who conduct monitoring in places of detention and engage with law enforcement and authorities to check on uh, this. Uh, and uh, um, a part uh, can, can also, what they can do is uh, to, if they identify uh, such a tools, and uh, of course they can stress in their recommendations, especially when there is a national preventive mechanism, they should uh, really uh, engage in, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, monitor such tools and uh, report on that and follow, and because their report is also uh, public. It's not uh, similar to the SPT report. is uh, is confidential. We submit confidential report. I think it's uh, also the NHRI, National Human Rights Institution, if they educate themselves about this, will play a big role in in monitoring state who use uh, such uh, tools and instrument uh, that uh, uh, Alice uh, right now uh, uh, mentioned in in her really very interesting report. It's a it's a new uh, a new phase that uh, monitoring body they should train themselves and engage in investigating about it. Thank you. I present that there are questions, but I also know that some of our panelists have to leave. So I'd like to, if anyone has to leave, perhaps feel free to. Thank you, to go. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank Edwards. You. Thank you. Mr. Heller, excuse me. <laughs> it's my fault. Afram, I think you had a question. Yes, I'm sorry, just to follow up on all the details you've been giving us of these instruments. For example, in the United States, these instruments, when they're produced, are they used inside the United States prison, for example, or are they exported to other countries? And if so, where is the market for such, uh, for example, from the US? Yeah, it's, a, it's a very good question. The research I was able to do was only at this stage where they're manufactured and promoted, but for international trade fairs, so actually selling them to other locations. Um, the EU has an EU anti-torture regulation already, but interestingly, even that is only for to ban certain items for external trade and not within the European Union. So they also have a gap uh, in their uh, framework. Um, uh, we're hoping to do much more work on kind of tracking down where the items... We know from incidents when these weapons are used, uh, it's not always so evident which country they're manufactured in uh, and where they um, are produced. And that's why I've also in the report mentioned procurement rules. You know, the transparency around where you're procuring uh, your law enforcement equipment will be in a key part of kind of going forward, including for the, the treaty or other instrument. And I'm, yeah. I'm sorry, also, do you have a number of what the profit uh, rate is of this industry? How much money do they make? So the, the forecasts for the subset, which is law enforcement equipment, I'm also looking at equipment for prisons and psychiatric institutes where restraints and other uh, equipment is used. The subset on law enforcement equipment is currently valued at 18 billion US dollars. Um, it's expected to have a compound growth rate of around 8% per year. So by 2028, it's at 27 billion US dollars. Um, those figures to me sound underestimates when compared to other industries, um, but that's what the major police and law enforcement uh, forecasters are suggesting. Um, And there's a lot about the industry, of course, we don't know because there are many places in the world that are manufacturing um, 
goods, but we don't know the profit uh, margins, uh, etc. But it's a, a significant uh, industry. Just one last follow-up. Sorry, Tisam. Um, um, <laughs> sorry. Efra, maybe we'll go to Ivan yeah. then come yeah. back to you if that's okay. Yeah, and it's it's actually also also following up. I just need to be clear on this because you mentioned there were fifty four countries who are producing the prohibited your prohibited list, right? But sixty three countries manufacturing items which could be legitimately used for law enforcement. So the figures you just mentioned with regard to the growth in the industry that relates to the legitimate law enforcement instruments, not the prohibited list. The forecasters don't distinguish yeah. between the equipment. Okay. So that is the industry speculation on kind of the, the size uh, of the mar in general, okay. yes. So, uh, so the, the things you were talking about, like the spiked battens and the serrated edges, that kind of thing, um, is that, are they manufactured in the same countries that you mentioned that manufacture the other law enforcement equipment? You said China, the EU, Israel. Etc. They are manufacturing the uh, prohibited list items as well. Um, I have an annex three. It is a complicated. <laughs> it was. It's complicated also uh, this end to kind of decipher everything. Um, there is an annex three to my report, which has tables which document the names of the countries and the items that they are manufacturing. So if you're interested okay. in a particular country, um, you'll be able to find that. Um, but for example, the category A restraints, so these are the thumb cuffs, etc. They were manufactured or promoted by 92 companies in 21 countries. Then the thumb cuffs are 51 companies in 21, uh, 51 companies in 15 states. Uh, the striking kinetic impact weapons collectively, 133 countries, 133 companies in 35 states. The spiked batons and spiked shields were manufactured or promoted in by 27 companies in three states, so it's a smaller uh, piece. But the electric shock weapons was by over 200 companies in 38 states. So. That's in paragraph 38 of the report, um, and there is some other information. We don't know, I don't know enough about the millimetre wave weapons, but they seem to be manufactured in the United States, and even there there's information about the health effects of this are, un, are unassessed at this stage. Um, and they're all the prohibited, That's the, they're the prohibited list, so there is a, a sizeable market still. Thanks very much. My name is Dulce Leinbach from Pass Blue. I wanted to ask you, I just saw briefly in that uh, report on the prohibited items that you also said that uh, you reached out to Russia to talk about their um, torture uh, but got no response. So wh who technically do you try to contact there? Yeah, so um, I have... Uh, written to the Russian Federation on a whole range of um, issues, including some relate, a number of cases relating to um, uh, Alexei Navalny. I've written on a number of occasions. The Crew Against Torture, NGO, which has been now banned uh, for on terrorism-related uh, charges, but also in relation to allegations of torture in the uh, since the Russian invasion uh, in Ukraine. My letters are sent to Lavrov via the permanent mission uh, in Geneva, um, and I've had no uh, response from them. I have recently requested a country visit uh, to the Russian Federation, um, and uh, we'll see whether there's a response uh, to that. I mean, in the past, have they uh, uh, allowed a, a special rapporteur on torture to come in and talk to them in Moscow, in Lavrov's office? The, I, th I am at seven letters to the Russian Federation presently, and 
on the website, the non-responses start since I took up the mandate. That also more or less coincides with uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine in terms of the start of the, the responses. So I let you <laughs> make an assessment uh, on that. But it's, a, I mean, I am continuing to reach out. I've requested meetings. I also, and I think this is important to note, in advance of my visit to Ukraine, I sent a letter to the Russian authorities informing them that I was visiting Ukraine and part of my visit was to check and verify the status and conditions of treatment of Russian prisoners of war, giving them the opportunity to provide me with the names uh, and other bio data and suspected places where those individuals may be being held by the Ukrainian authorities. And even then I received no uh, reply. I did uh, visit uh, one prisoner of war camp in Ukraine. I carried out a country visit uh, in September. Um, uh, and so I have uh, checked up and uh, verified that uh, Russian prisoners of war are being uh, treated in line with international humanitarian law uh, in the Ukraine. Uh, but do you know offhand how many Russian prisoners of war are being held by Ukraine? I'd have to, I did have a figure when I was there, I'm sure it's uh, changed um, and I can't recall off the top of my head how many were in the facility uh, that I visited. I wouldn't like to uh, guess a figure. I can come back to you on that if you're interested. One last question and, and we'll end right where we started. Yeah, to some. A quick follow-up on the question before regarding, Ephraim's question before regarding um, the industry, um, is there a list, uh, I mean, I assume some of these companies who produce these weapons are also weapon companies, etc. but is there a list of c the names of companies? Or is there other companies who produce this that they are not necessarily uh, specialized in this? I mean, do we, is there an idea? I haven't uh, disclosed the names of the companies behind uh, the research, uh, partly for, at this stage, legal reasons. Um, but there, we do have the data on uh, the companies. Um, there's uh, certainly for some a crossover with those engaged in arms uh, and other weapons. And then there are other companies that are purely working on law enforcement uh, type equipment. And do you intend to publish that? Uh, I names. haven't. Uh, I haven't decided. We are. I am now strategizing next steps. But one of my uh, next uh, steps will be to write to all of the major um, weapons trade fairs um, and sending the list of prohibited items, so they also can be monitors uh, of making sure they're not uh, complicit in the promotion of items that are considered uh, cruel, inhuman, or degrading uh, per se. So it will be a process of kind of following up on this. Very quick one, uh, Paulina. Sorry. Um, just the question, just to clarify. So the mere fact of allowing such companies to operate in a certain country, does that constitute a breach of the Convention on the Prevention of Torture? Just the very fact that they're present or not? No, um, not the presence. Um, I have tied it all back to the absolute prohibition on torture and inhuman and degrading treatment. Um, you know, states are obliged uh, and have obligations to prohibit torture. And if these are inherently torturous items, then they have an obligation to make sure that companies take them off uh, the market and to regulate the market better. Um, at the same time, the report goes into detail around uh, the application of the guiding principles on business and human rights and making operators much more due diligent uh, in uh, the work that they're doing. Um, you know, it is profiting off human misery as opposed to profiting off legitimate law enforcement if they are selling and manufacturing these uh, or engaged in research and development. So that's kind of the line that I, I draw on that.
all of you. Um, just a housekeeping note, tomorrow at 11 a.m. in this room, there will be a joint press conference by the Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights of Defenders, as well as the Special Rapporteur on the Rights to Freedom of Peaceful Assembly and Association. Thank you very much.